Welcome everybody. My name is Nina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts in the U.S. There are 17 Ashlands in, in uh, the U.S. So I just want to make sure we're, you know, we're in Massachusetts. And um, I am here with Marion Gibson, who's going to be talking about her book, um, Witchcraft, the 13, a History in 13 Trials. Um, and, but before I get to her, I'm going just a couple things. I want to say thank you to the friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programming. I would also like to thank Marion for letting us share this program with other libraries and 20 local libraries jumped onto this. So they've been promoting it and their, their uh, patrons are here and we're very excited about that because, you know, I think when librarians get together, we make magic. Um, not like witchcraft magic where we would get burned at the stake, but just magic. <laughs> like the good magic. So um, you can buy signed books from Marion from our, uh, our favorite indie bookstore, um, Aesop's Fable, and I will put the link for that in the chat. This is an hour long Q&A. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, which is at the button at the bottom of your screen. You can chat with each other all you want in chat, but I um, that goes by too quickly for me to really pay attention to. So please put your questions in the Q&A, and I'm sure we'll have plenty. Okay, so Marion Gibson. I'm not going to say a whole lot about you, except that you, you're a historian of witchcraft and magic. I did not even know that was a thing. <laughs> so, it's a marvelous thing. <laughs> Well, yes, I am. Here. Um, yeah, so tell us more about yourself and how you, you know, who you are, and then we'll talk about the book and take lots more. Lovely, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me, first of all. And it's, I mean, it's just so brilliant to see people from all over. Um, we were just chatting before you guys arrived and saying, this is so wonderful. You know, we can share this chat all over the world. And I can see people from all over America and I can see people from all over Massachusetts, especially, of course, the towns where people are prosecuted for witchcraft. So I'm excited. I'm genuinely excited by that. Thank you for coming. So um, about me then. So I'm a professor who teaches at Exeter University in the UK, which is down in the southwest near Plymouth, which is a place that you will know of, um, where people emigrated from to Massachusetts indeed. So I started being interested in the history of witchcraft about 25 years ago now, which sounds like a very long time when you put it like that, doesn't it? Um, and I got interested because I was given an Elizabethan pamphlet, a kind of early newspaper about a witch trial. And when I read this, I realised that what I was looking at was really the words of women, mostly accused women, particularly, but also women who were accusing other women um, and actually relatively few men. And there was this very interesting community of women talking to each other. And I realised that you didn't tend to hear those sort of voices in the historical record. You know, these were ordinary people. They lived in remote villages. And as they were talking, you know, often they were confessing to women witchcraft which I didn't believe that they could have done I didn't think that they were rightly on trial for these crimes but as they confessed or as they they refused to confess they told me all this stuff about their lives so you know they they told me about their children and what had happened to them they told me about the kind of work that they did you know were they dyeing cloth were they making bread what were they doing with their lives and I just got more and more interested in those people and as I went along I became more and more fascinated by this question well if I don't think that they did do the witchcraft crimes that they were accused of I don't think they hurt their neighbors by magic well what did they do to get themselves into this position and to be put in this position by other people so why were there witch trials were these people doing any kind of magic yes they might have been did I think it was witchcraft probably not but what kind of a magical world did they live in and everything opened up from there really mm -hmm. wow I'm going to dig really deep into that in a minute, but I wanted to ask first, um, did you always know you were going to be a writer and historian or and or a teacher when you were younger? Do you know what? I wanted to be a librarian. <laughs> It Isn't that cool? Awesome, right? <laughs> Nobody's ever asked me that. Yeah, I did. I, 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 you know, I, I came from a relatively rural place, and there wasn't a huge amount of 
career choice there. And the best career I could see there was a librarian. I thought this looks great because I can spend my time surrounded by books. And I think I would probably still quite happily do that. But the chance came up, you know, off you go to university. And I realized that actually I was quite good at writing and I was quite good at researching too. And I loved both of them. And so I went with that and it all flowed from there really. But there, yeah, the, this is terrible, isn't it? This just sounds like flattery, but there is nothing like a good life. <laughs> That's not flattery to me, just reality. <laughs> so, but why did you go into, I know you said that 25 years ago you saw, saw this pamphlet, but why history particularly, uh, and then particularly which? Yeah, I just feel I, I, I love the idea of the past that, that is so present all around us still. Um, you know, you can't go anywhere without thinking about, you know, who built this building and why, who opened this institution and why, what happened in this place, why does this landscape look like this, oh look here's a monument to somebody, I don't know who they are, why don't I go and research them, all of that fascinates me and I don't think really I would have been interested in witchcraft and magic if it wasn't for realising that I was hearing stories through witchcraft trials that I wouldn't have heard in other ways. Mm -hmm. So here were people coming to my attention that, you know, they didn't make the laws. They, these women were not consulted about church matters. They couldn't be magistrates. They couldn't be uh, churchmen. They didn't have much education. They had not left traces of themselves in any other way. So what I really got interested in was the hidden histories, mm -hmm. if you like, the voices of people who we don't normally hear mm -hmm. from that past, which is so evident around us, but is often quite difficult to access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love the hidden stories because I feel like um, only people that are really love research and digging really can get into it um, and share it with us. So. Um, and librarians do that too, by the way, just wanted to say, but I'm interested that you decided to go towards teaching and included writing in it, as opposed to just being an, not just, but like going towards being an author. Yes, I did want that. I wanted to tell other people about these things because I really, you know, I felt like if people had told me more about history when I was younger, I would just have been even more fascinated. And I also feel that it's really important to talk to women and girls about history because, again, so often it's not the history of women and girls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not the history of poorer people either or rural people, people who are in, excluded in other ways from the record of, you know, big city men doing big city things so I wanted to talk more to people about that and make them feel like history was for them mm -hmm. because I felt like you know it was for me even though I didn't know it it was always calling to me so if I can just get one more person to feel like go down to your local library go to your local archive this is for you you can do this you know you can learn the skills to access the old records just go and get a library card and start there so that's that's really why I do it. I was terribly shy as a girl. I couldn't possibly have done this. <laughs> but you learn, you know, you just get to you get to be able to do what it is that you want to do. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting um, because I was also really shy. And here we are, right? Um, and here we are talking to 500 people or so. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Rachel asks, are there still witch trials today? And I'm curious about that question because your book is super accessible it makes it it makes the whole thing the whole history of it very accessible to people like me who are just reading um and so we learn but we're going to start with that question are witch trials still happening today and then to really talk about how it's a, it was a worldwide phenomenon sure yeah yes they are uh yes they are still happening today Rachel absolutely and the book goes into that towards the end so really what it is it's like a 700 year history basically I look at what you might call the peak period of the witch hunts so 15th to 18th century shall we say um, when people are actually being put on trial for the crime of witchcraft and punished for it but then what interested me as I spent all these years researching you know the history of witchcraft was what witches mean to people today and of course students would come to class and they would say oh you know I saw this thing on the telly I saw charmed you know I saw bewitched I I you know I went to a play in the theater and, and I saw the crucible 
And so I started thinking, hang on, this is still really relevant, isn't it? Um, so I got drawn more into thinking what witches mean to people today. And of course, you know, we all know people who use the phrase witch hunt. Mm. And around the world, there are still hundreds and hundreds of people on trial for witchcraft. And the book goes to some of those places towards the end. So it looks at Southern Africa, where there are still lots of trials. People are routinely, I'm sorry to say, killed or exiled from their villages because they're thought to be witches. And it happens in other places around the world, too. You know, it happens in Nepal. It happens in Indonesia. Um, around the world, traditional healers of various kinds are under attack. So, yeah, absolutely, there are still witch trials today. But I also think it's quite interesting to pay attention to the way we use the idea of, of witches and witch trials um, as a metaphor. You know, we talk about other things in society, other kinds of crime or transgression or persecution through using the word witch. And I think that's really interesting too. Yeah, we've had two, I think I told you, we had two programs with the Salem Witch Museum and they did talk about how currently in current atmosphere, we're using those, those kind of, that kind of language um, to justify things. Um, that's what I'll say. Okay, so I'm going to go into questions because we're already getting a bunch. Um, Scott asks, if you could tell us a few of the witch trials in your book. I know there's a lot. <laughs> there's a few, so <laughs> like maybe a couple that really rose to the top for you. Yeah, sure. The first one, I think, is one that surprised me, and I wanted it to surprise the readers too. And it's a story from 1485 in Austria. And it's about this inquisitor, so uh, an official of the Catholic Church, which was really the only Christian church then, and he's looking to hold a witch trial. He's decided that his world is full of wicked witches, and it's his job to go out and find them and punish them. So we sort of start off with his journey, but increasingly as we go through the story, we realise it's not his story, because, um, you know, his story's been told before. It's a story of a woman in particular, who he accuses so we hear from her and her name is Helena Scheuberin and she's still up to him and I just thought that was such an interesting place to start the book so he asks her questions quite intrusive questions and she refuses to answer them and from that the whole witch trial starts to unpick itself and I just thought that was a really interesting place to start and then I go on to talk about a Scottish witchcraft trial from the 1590s and a northern Norwegian one which includes some indigenous people so some of the people who lived around the Arctic Circle in the early 17th century um, so it includes some of them and then what do we do then we go to America so we go to Virginia um, where guess what and you know this isn't something that I've known for a very long time actually before Salem, there were many other American witch trials, and the earliest one was in 1626, which is just so early, isn't it? And it wasn't where you'd expect. It wasn't where you are in Massachusetts. It was in Virginia. So I thought, wow, that's a story we need to tell. And that's the story of a woman called Joan Wright, who is accused by her, her, her settler neighbours. And then where do we go? Then we go back to England and we look at the Witchfinder General trials, as they were called, um, during the English Civil war and then we come back to Salem and then a bit later so I have a sort of intermission in the middle of the book it's kind of in two halves so the first part is the history of the period of the witch hunts and then we have a kind of 18th century pause and then we move on to the way the witch has reinvented after the 18th century when they stop holding mass witch trials and instead they start thinking oh witchcraft is about what it's about subversion it's about politics it's about policing sexual attitudes it's it's about religion and so on and so forth. So we go to France to look at a case that happens in the early 18th century. And then we move on through the 19th, 20th century. So we look at another American case. There was somebody accused of witchcraft and somebody actually murdered um, as an accused witch in Pennsylvania in the 1920s, which again is something that you don't necessarily expect to happen. And then we went right forward to the present at the end of the book. So we look at a case in Lesotho in southern africa in the 1940s and we look at the state of play with witch trials in southern africa today and then we move to america again and we look at the idea of the witch hunting contemporary north american society and did you know right this is another fascinating little fact did you know that as late as 2018 in canada people were still 
being tried under a British Witchcraft Act that came in in the 1730s. Now, I didn't know that either, you see, until I started looking at the book. So there's a really broad range of, of trials for people to think about. Um, and like I say, I mean, sometimes, at times I wish I hadn't started this because it's really hard. But I think it's worth looking at that really long 7th century history because it really tells you a lot about what witches meant in the past and what they mean today. Mm -hmm. And I love in, in your book, you really talk about... Um, what were the underlying reasons? It wasn't just hysteria. It wasn't just, you know, uh, one thing. It was, you know, it's very, very wide range of reasons why people would do such, you know, do the accusing. And interestingly, like why women accused women? I think we were talking about that a little bit before we started. What was your sense of that? Like what was going on there? Yeah, I think it's a very competitive world that they live in. And we were talking a little bit about the lack of roles for women, weren't we, in, you know, the 15th to 18th centuries. What could you do? You could become a wife and mother if, if you were lucky. You know, in some cases, women couldn't even do that. But if that was what you did with your life, you know, you probably worked on your farm or you worked in your husband's business. And that was quite a narrow world. You, you may very well have felt frustrated with that. And you may have turned against some of your neighbours because it was such a small world and everybody was kind of bottled up together in these little villages and I think some of it does come about because of these kind of well kind of petty tensions really but to the people involved in them of course they weren't petty you know it was really important to you if you were I don't know say a farmer's wife in um in in Essex County in England in the 1640s and your cow died that was a huge disaster for you so it was quite likely that you would look around you and think, you know, well, I haven't done anything. Um, I don't know why this cow is sick. My neighbor's cows aren't sick. But last week, you know, I did have that row with that woman who came to the gate and asked me for some milk and I didn't give it to her. Or I did, but she complained about it and she said, it, you know, it, it wasn't enough. And she went away mumbling to herself and I was frightened and I thought, oh, I hope I haven't upset her. And then my cow died. Um, and, you know, imagine how much worse that is if it's your child that has become sick and perhaps even died. There, there are horrible things that are happening to people in this society. And they don't have, they don't, just don't have the explanations that we have. You know, they don't have modern medicine and they don't understand things like meteorology and, and you know, bacteria and all the sort of things that can impact on a farming lifestyle. So I think it was those reasons, really. It's not just about churchmen and magistrates, male magistrates accusing women, although that is part of the picture. It is also about other women accusing women and it's about men being accused as well. So we think about the, the slew of witch trials that historians have looked at across the world. About 75% of the people accused are women. So it is really, that is a really important thing to think about. It's not just a stereotype. It is actually a true statistic. But of course, that leaves 25% who are men. So we have to think about why well, they're accused too. That's really interesting because I think my perspective, it was always about either power or self-preservation. So knowing that there was like this, it was just a different time. It's really interesting. Um, I'm going to go back to some questions. Um, Siza asked, how old is witchcraft? At, um, you know, how far back does it go? Is it from the ancient world, beyond, or, and, and I, because I know you're just talking about the last 730 years in your book. Just those, yeah, <laughs> just those. <laughs> yes, it does go back a really, really long way, actually. <clears throat> so you can find it in, you can find magic in the very earliest societies. And it's kind of caught up with religion. Um, as you see in many traditional societies around the world today, you know, there's not really much of a dividing line in some places between the idea of magic and the idea of religion. It's all about a spiritual world, a supernatural world, and how human beings interact with that. But yes, going back to ancient Egypt, you know, you can find people who are accused of doing bad magic. And then as you come forward, 
through the Middle Ages in Europe, you see lots of examples. Really, before the, the big period of the witch trials kicks off in the 15th century, you find lots of examples of individuals in villages who are accused. And then maybe they're exiled, maybe they're driven out, maybe in some circumstances they're killed. But it isn't really till the 15th century you get these enormous organised witch hunts. But magic, yeah, is a very, very old thing. I think the human mind turns naturally to ideas of magic and ideas of supernatural explanations for things mm -hmm. and so I you know we jokingly said that 700 years did you pick that span of time because that's when the majority or it really became a thing yeah um, with the witch trials that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell the story of that big flourishing of witch trials um, mm -hmm. from the late Middle Ages onwards, really, and then trace that history as it runs through to today. Yes. Thank you. Um, Ellen asked an interesting question about how far reaching were the witch trials? Were they global? I know you've talked about England, Africa and America, though. Yes, I yes, I would have loved to have done a complete global history, but I think it's probably too difficult. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's something that historians will have a crack at in the future. But this, what I've tried to do really is talk about the Christianized world, because that's the one that I know, that's the one that I start from um, with European, American and African history being brought together by the idea of Christianity traveling across the globe to different communities and what those communities do with that. So the Christian idea of God versus the devil and the idea of God's good people versus the devil's bad people, that, that for me is the heart of what the book does but absolutely you know in uh, other societies people have the idea of witches so you know if you travel to the very far east people will talk about witches spirits demons and so on it's just that it's slightly differently conceptualized in those societies so you don't have the idea of the big witch trial in quite the same way things happen at different times the supernatural world looks different there because it's framed by a different religion so what i've tried to do is talk about the christian Christianized world as, as what the book covers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting a bunch of questions about the gendering of witchcraft, meaning like you had already said that 75% of the accused were women and that left quite a few, you know, 25% for men. But what was that? It, you know, like um, why, why was that focused on women for the most part? Why were men uh, accused? And was there some fear of female sexuality and all of that like where is this going in terms of sexuality as well yeah I think so to take the last question first yes I think that's absolutely at the root of a lot of this I don't think it's any coincidence that this idea of witch hunting starts in monastic communities which are entirely male communities and I think there is a good deal of suspicion and fear of women their sexuality their power their knowledge the way their bodies work all of this stuff mm -hmm. um, so you get these horribly misogynistic books and, and one of these is written by by the guy who does the first witch trial in my book and he says you know he says these terrible things about women he says women are intellectually like children when women think alone they think evil thoughts you know, women are obsessed by lust they will even have sex with devils because they're so lustful and you think you think that because you live in an all-male community don't you and you've probably been brought up in one for your whole life and you don't have any knowledge of women and you're probably frightened of them you mm. know and plus you're you're a very unusual type of man um, are very problematic so I think that a lot of those ideas come out of that community of scholars and it, it's really sad that they were scholars they were actually some of the most educated people of their time and they come up with this horrible conspiracy theory isn't that an awful thing but yes I think that's where it comes from and therefore, women are the majority of the victims because the stereotype of the witch builds itself around a female figure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, witches are the opposite of all those good monks and good kings and good rulers and good magistrates and good teachers and, you know, all the good stuff. Um, because people think in this binary way about the world and therefore that means that 
the ones on this side are good and the ones on this side must be wholly evil and we must get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where it comes from. But when men are accused, it's quite often because they're associated with a woman who's been accused. So maybe, you know, they're the son of somebody who was previously accused of witchcraft, or maybe they're the husband of a wife who has been accused. They're often brought in that way. Every now and again, though, you get somebody who's a learned man like the people who you know invented the idea of witch hunting and sometimes they get accused too you know there's a couple of cases where it's a schoolmaster again it's somebody in the community who would normally be a respected male figure and everybody would look up to him but somebody's got the idea that he's been practicing bad magic and it's usually learned magic you know it's stuff like astrology or it's, it's book magic if you like but somebody's got the idea that he's bad and they go after him and you get a couple of uh, vicars or uh, or ministers accused um, so for example at Salem you get the Reverend George Burrow uh, you know who, who's a, a minister of the the church in Salem who's moved somewhere else to minister to another community but he's, he's hauled back and put on trial and killed and that seems to be more about a sense that he's a problematic male figure you know he's not the good authority figure so therefore he must be a bad authority figure and they they pick on him partly because of that because he's got this kind of troubled personal history but also because they think he's a heretic of various kinds as well mm -hmm. So again, this binary thinking, you know, good religion is good, but the, the other kind of religion must all be bad and ultimately must be satanic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah wow, I know. It's yeah. a disappointing thing about humans, isn't it? And, and the book focuses on this quite a bit, this idea that we go around looking for enemies. We go around looking to polarise the world and, and to pick on other people and scapegoat them. And it would be great if we didn't do that quite so much. Yeah, oh, the world would be very different if that was not the case. But um, I have this really interesting question from Caitlin. Um, she emailed me a, a couple of days ago. So it's a little bit long. I'm going to read the whole thing. Elizabeth first, the first had an astrologer, Dr. D, whom she consulted regularly for advice. The 16th century was a time of great superstition, of well-founded fears for plague, physical violence, and the of religious upheaval. Um, how was Elizabeth able to reconcile her belief in astrology when witchcraft one of, was one of those normal fears? Did it do with witches being mostly female while her astrologers were male? Why would that make a difference? Yes, I do think that's really, that's, yeah, that's a clever, clever question. Yes, I do think that's a factor. Absolutely. So it's the gender thing in part. Yes, you know, she relies on John Dee and others who are these very learned, um, well-trained, well-respected figures. And she believes that they have access to this occult knowledge, this occult science, and that this is okay. People, I think, in that period found it very difficult to draw the line between what was okay magic and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for her, the astrologers just sit on the right side of it. But every now and again, somebody would get onto the wrong side of it. You know, there's a famous case in the 1620s where an astrologer is murdered on the streets of London because people have decided that he is not the good man that he appears, but in fact, he's much more like a witch. So people like John Dee did run a lot of risks in practicing what they did. You know, had the Queen changed her mind, things would have gone very differently for him. Hmm. Um, which brings us to the next question, which um, kind of dovetails into that. Christine and Suresh, are both, to, Christine asks about, uh, did women have special, actually have any special powers? And Suresh has a comment about um, medicine because you had mentioned healers. Um, so is that something that people were looking at and thinking, oh, that's not right. They must be a witch. Yes, partly it was. And again, it's about that boundary. It's about where people draw the boundary, really. So it was quite usual. Imagine, you know, imagine you're living in an early American or uh, German or English community. You don't have access to a lot of doctors and most of you can't afford to go to the doctor anyway, because he's a very highly trained physician and he has enormous fees. So what do you do if you get sick or your child gets sick? You call in one of your neighbours who you think knows something about this, basically. Very often they're a woman 
mm -hmm. because you know they're the midwives of the community they they are the the nurses of the community they're the people who sit with sick people and attempt to do something to alleviate at least their symptoms even if they don't know what the cause of the disease is so you go to one of them and most of the time that's fine but if something goes wrong during the treatment process or you start to suspect this person isn't maybe the you know the good religious person that you thought they were it would be quite easy for you to start suspecting that in fact they were a witch so you do find lots of people drawn into witch trials because they're healers and sometimes they use magic in their healing as well you know being as they don't have modern medicine what else do they turn to well some of the things we've talked about already astrology for example um or you know ideas of saying prayers and charms and spells which all kind of merge into each other over sick people in the hope that that will drive the disease away and again that's fine if it works and everybody's happy what if it doesn't work what if you fall out over the payment you know what if if the sick person dies rather than getting better well there's a witchcraft trial waiting to happen really isn't it I, I don't think I personally believe that they had or have special powers but I'm really really interested in the idea that people believe that they do so people believe that about them themselves and I talk about some people in the book I talk about a spiritualist medium who I'm pretty convinced thought that she could do the things that she was ultimately accused of faking and you know I talk about some healers in Pennsylvania who are working with a kind of what they call hex magic a kind of a magic that they believe to be a sort of religious service to the community but they end up accusing each other of witchcraft and one of them gets killed in that process so whilst I don't personally think that there is a magical power, because, you know, I'm a historian, I'm a scholar, it, it's just, yeah, I've kind of gone down that route, really, rather than the other route, which is a very available one of believing, well, actually, they did have those powers. But even though I don't think that they, they did and do myself, I'm really fascinated by people who think that they do have those powers, and particularly by other people in the community who think that they have them, mm. and become afraid of them for one reason or another. I think that's where the seeds of witch trials really, really often lie. Mm -hmm. It's curious because, you know, we can say that back then they didn't have the, the knowledge of medicine and, and bacteria and things like that. So we can say, OK, well, we understand that there was that fear and that's why there was the witchcraft, but it's still happening. So, you know, I know that we use things like magic to explain things that we feel are unexplainable but it's still happening, even it with our that knowledge, right? So that is yes. happening. Yes. Um, so Lisa asked an interesting question. Um, if you identify as a witch, which you just said, clearly you don't. And do you believe that somebody can have a calling in life to, to be a witch? I don't see why not. Yes. You know, I started off early on in my career thinking that, modern witches people who identify as witches or wiccans you know that's nothing to do with the witch trials that's completely different but actually over time you know as I've learned more about it I think actually no there is a continuum here it's not that people are accessing something that the old witches had because I don't believe those people actually were witches I think they they were innocent people persecuted for all the wrong reasons if you see what I mean but I think what people do see in the figures of those witches from the era of the witch hunts is a really powerful sense of resistance and a really powerful sense of female power. Imagined in the wrong ways, maybe, but imagined nevertheless. And when I try and reconstruct one of those stories, one of the things I try and hang on to is the sense that the accused person did have some agency, they did have some power, they could at least make decisions mm -hmm. about what was happening to them and they could resist it as far as they could or they could tell a story about their lives as they, they kind of went down fighting, if you know what I mean. And I think what modern witches and Wiccans often see in those trials is that thing, that sort of kernel of somebody's, the importance of somebody's life and feeling that that might empower people today to know about those people, to know that story and to imagine themselves as witches therefore and yes I often get witches and Wiccans come to classes and people ask me all the time if I'm a witch I don't mind that a bit no I don't identify as one but I know lots of people who do mm -hmm. that's awesome um I have two questions about uh current witchcraft um Sam asks what do you think of the modern day of modern day witchcraft especially in terms of commercialism 
Yes, I do talk about that a little bit in the book. Actually, it's very lucrative, isn't it, quite often, because there are lots of beautiful things that people can sell to one another um, in witchy shops. And when I go around them myself, I'm always thinking, oh, that's pretty, <laughs> that's nice. No, you don't need that. Um, I think that's really interesting. I, th I think witchcraft has always been commercial because almost everything that people do with each other ends up being commercialised in some way so even if you go back to say the 16th century you'll find people selling spells to each other you know they do it for money and sometimes it's barter it's a barter system so you know a woman will do a spell for another woman and she'll say you know you may not have a couple of shillings to give me but could you give me some cheese instead or you know a pint of milk so actually it was always a commercial transaction and I do think that continues today. Mm -hmm. um, Rob says he's a retired university history professor he wrote a piece on the controversy in modern Salem when a statue of Elizabeth Montgomery touched off a debate over whether witchcraft was being disneyfied too little too late on that score just wondering if you've encountered witchcraft tourism like Salem anywhere else and how they negotiate the tourism versus the history mm, I don't think there's anywhere like Salem I mean I haven't been for years what with the pandemic and everything okay. and I really miss it. Um, I think it's a wonderful place. If you're a scholar of witchcraft, it's just a magnet, isn't it? Because there's there's just so much to think about there and it's just so fascinating. The only place that, I think there probably are quite a few places now because people are more interested in the history of witchcraft now. And, you know, I get, I have conversations with people all the time who are artists or writers and they've been asked to commemorate somebody in their community who was, you know, maybe hanged in the 17th century or or whatever um so that happens all the time but the only place that I've really felt is anything like Salem is Pendle in Lancashire in the north country um in England where there was a big witch trial in 1612 um I think 10 probably 10 people are executed something like that and you know it has its witch shop it has its witch witch trail you know where you can go around the landscape visiting the places um where people lived or where actually accusations were made the local university makes a good deal of it um, you can visit the castle wonderful old castle where the witches uh, were imprisoned before they were put on trial and convicted so that sort of feels a bit like Salem but it's not the same kind of phenomenon and it doesn't have the same sort of attraction for pagan people and for tourists um, and for history buffs mm -hmm. so I think Salem's unique in bringing all those people together actually um, I don't know if you heard this, but last year and the year before, I believe, Salem actually had to tell people not to come there because it, I think they had over 100,000 people visit oh. two years ago in October. In October. Wow. Yeah. Yes. So like it, was in, it was just nuts. So, that's amazing. Wow. Yeah, that's a really interesting statistic, isn't it? It is. I, I think it's partly because a lot of this stuff is outdoors. So like post-COVID, people felt comfortable being outdoors. But um, yeah, it, was, it, was, it definitely brought up some things. COVID definitely brought up something that increased interest in Salem. Yes, that doesn't surprise me, actually, yeah. So Linda asks, have you considered researching earlier occurrences of witchcraft? Because the Bible tells us Saul went to see the witch of Endor. Yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. And people in the period that I've written about are really interested in that story. And they kept going back to it, trying to define what they thought the witch was and what sort of thing that she was doing. I haven't. It's partly because I don't really have the language skills, actually. So by the time you get a bit further back, you're mostly looking at Latin, you're looking at ancient Greek, you look at Hebrew. Yeah. So the kind of I have colleagues who, who are, you know, very fluent in these languages and look at the more ancient history but for me I get more comfortable when it starts to move into English with a bit of Latin that I could cope with so really it's the later period that I'm most interested in and you know places where places where Google Translate can help you and a good dictionary can help you um, find out a bit more but mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 it is also a flourishing field the, the study of classical magic if you like oh, interesting. Um, Robert um, who I think is on the set of this movie asked if you research using uh, films, he was on this movie called Burned at the Stake, released in 1981, but you had also mentioned Bewitched and Charmed and, you know, so many others, even, um, was it Lucifer? Oh my God, that was 
<laughs> there's loads isn't there I yeah. know there's a new one along every year that's fascinating um yes I do yes I do and that's something that I do a lot in class because we you know we work a lot with with visual text so we look at film but we also look at old woodcuts um you know images of witches from the past and we look at paintings like Goya um and Fuseli and some of the the, the painters and and um you know lithographers and people from the past who were interested in the visual image of the witch yeah. so yes I'm Absolutely. And I will always watch anything which is about witches or magic because you never know. Uh, and there are acres and acres of horror films, especially from like the 70s and 80s, um, that were about this kind of thing. And they're all of them interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, I will never be able to watch The Omen again, so I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of them are pretty horrid, aren't they? Quite scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Stephen says, which is you know wizards usually male and good, which is usually female and bad. What are your thoughts on that? Because we've already you know we you said that the w male uh, witches or whatever uh, during the witch trials were treated just as badly, probably. Yes, yeah, they were. You know, once you'd got into the system and you were being accused of witchcraft, you were treated horribly. It didn't really matter who you were. Um, it's interesting that they were all thought of as witches, though. The word wizard and the, and the word um, warlock are, are a little bit more modern. So you, you get wizards starting to occur from about the 17th century in regular use. And warlock comes along a bit later, kind of 18th, 19th century. So it's interesting that people thought about them in two categories. Mm -hmm. um, but in the period of the witch hunts, I think there was a lot more sense that these people are all the same. I, mm -hmm. I don't think people in that period had a sense that they were looking particularly for women. They were just kind of constantly surprised that, oh, the suspect is a woman again. There we go. But I think they treated them all equally as badly as each other once they had made that accusation. Mm, um, something that came up when we talked to uh, Salem uh, Witch Museum was uh, that children were involved. Children were accused or at least jailed with yes. their parents, maybe. What was that about? Mm. Yes, they were. Children were uh, both accused and accusers which is really interesting. They had a bit of a different role in that much tougher world of the past, especially in colonial society. So, you know, especially in, in America, um, children were quite often treated almost as if they were adults because they, they were colonists like anybody else. They were expected to pull their weight and, you know, do the right things and, and not, eat, not eat too much, um, you know, not be too much of a burden on resources, to keep silent, to push forward the religious agenda of the community, just like an adult would be actually um so i think they get involved because they're, they're treated as mini adults and that means that you can accuse them of horrible crimes and of course because they're children they'll quite often confess to them so yeah there are children as young as four um, there's a case I'm working on at the moment in, in the next thing that I'm looking at, an English witchcraft trial, where there's a nine-year-old boy accused. Um, and we don't even know what happens to him. You know, nobody bothers to write a proper record about what happens to him. And he's accused because his mother's been accused. So that happened quite often. But children are often accusers. Um, and again, you can see this happening at Salem, can't you, with Abigail Williams and Betty Paris being the accusers. And I think they they are taken seriously because they're seen not only to be kind of mini colonists, but also to be innocent. So when they start saying, I've been bewitched, I'm having these terrible fits, you know, they start screaming and crying and appear to be terribly ill. People take them seriously. And I think that's just because people had a different view of childhood in the past, really. I was going to say, I thought they were teenagers. Yeah, they were nine and 11, as oh. far as we can tell. So yes, Abigail, a very young teenager. When, when you see her in the crucible, Arthur Miller has made her a young woman and has in fact turned her into Winona Ryder in the film. <laughs> so that's a slightly different version of her. But yeah, they, they're kind of on the cusp of being teenagers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, Sharon says, I'm a PhD candidate finishing a project on early modern witchcraft representations in theatre. Have you thought about how people were, have fictionalized witchcraft either in the past or present? I'm especially thinking of plays like Macbeth or plays that were based on trials like the Witch of Edmonton or the late Lincolnshire witches. 
Yes, the academic books that I've written in the past. So this is really my first, you know, big trade book. But I've written a lot of academic books in the past. And I've thought quite a bit about that, actually. So if you have a look at my kind of back catalogue, you can see me writing because you start off as a literature professor, basically. So you can have a look at me thinking about Macbeth. And and I think all those plays are fascinating. You know, good for you. They'll be that'll be really interesting to read. I think that they ha they play a really big role in a culture which is inclined to put people on trial in real life for witchcraft. And I, I don't think you can quite look at the witch trials really without thinking, yeah, but at the same time, you know, they've got witches on stage. So people, at least in the big um, European capital, especially London, are going to see plays about witches. And it's the same argument, really, isn't it, that we, we have now about does film influence real life? You know, did Elizabethan theatre influence real life? Yes, I think it did to some extent. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, great, great, good topic. <laughs> Interestingly, we had a pro we had a program last week with Catherine Howe, who wrote um, about pirates, but her she started off her talk about, um, <clears throat> about the crucible, and saying that feeling like Arthur Miller sort of really was a bit pedantic about people back then, like using 21st or 20 whatever time he wrote this 20th century sensibilities around what was happening back then, which is exactly where you started this conversation is that people weren't what we are now in the 16th century. Yeah, no, they, they weren't. I mean, I think there are certain human traits that carry on, which is why I think you can write a long history about them. But at the same time, yeah, they did live in a very different world. You know, we, we've had one experience of pandemic. And for me, it's made a real difference, actually, to think how we, how I think about the world, because I feel like I understand a bit more about how vulnerable people must have thought in the past. You know, for a while the shield of modern medicine was taken away. And I started, like everybody else, just kind of kind of fell apart. Horrible, horrible time. Mm -hmm. um, and I started thinking, you know, what if you felt like that all the time? What if you thought all the time about bubonic plague and scarlet fever and typhoid and all the other things that can kill you? And what if at the same time, you know, it's not just that you can't get, I don't know, um, you know, red peppers. You can't get bell peppers at your local supermarket. What if you can't get anything and there isn't a local supermarket? And what you're reliant upon is, you know, the few scratchings of food that you can lever out of your neighbours in your community. Mm -hmm. What if there's no welfare safety net? We know it doesn't work as well as we want it to, even now. But my goodness, what if there's nothing? And I think that makes you think about the world in a very different way. And especially when you look at colonial societies, you know, imagine the settlers in Salem or in Virginia, um, how desperate their lives must have been, how anxious they must have been all the time, what great stress they must have been under. And plus, you know, they have all this conflict with the local indigenous peoples for, for you know, very good reasons. My goodness, it's almost no surprise that they turn to accusing each other of witchcraft, is it? <laughs> uh, people don't surprise me that much anymore. <laughs> um, Lisa asks, have you visited the Witchcraft Museum in both capitals, Cornwall? Yes, I have. Yes. Oh, have you? I hope so. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic little museum. I do recommend it. If any of you come to, to Britain or if any of you are in Britain already, uh, go to the Witchcraft Museum at Bos Castle. I think it opens only in the summer. So I think it opens from April. And it's just this fantastic museum. It's just pure Instagram fodder <laughs> everything in it looks absolutely amazing and it's all about the history of witchcraft and magic mm -hmm. um rachel says i repair gravestones in the salem area where uh were con those convicted in other places denied proper burial like in salem Oh, what interesting work. Yes, they were, I'm afraid. Yes. So you would quite like to be buried in a pit beside the gallows um, if that was what had happened to you. If you were burned to death, of course, and people were burned at the stake, just like the title of that film that we heard about earlier, there was almost nothing left to dispose of. So people were literally destroyed. Mm -hmm. which is a horrible thing to think about. They, they don't have a memorial. And I'm quite a big fan of putting up memorials now, actually, um, because I think it does encourage us to think about this history of persecution and maybe just to think a bit more about how we relate to each other that way. There is, um, a, a, I want to say, a statue or something in Salem now with all the people that were burned, you know, like uh, accused of witchcraft. 
So, you know, I mean, again, too little, too late, but at least it's being acknowledged and recognized. Yes, I think that's quite important, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Somebody asks, is there a relationship between pagans resisting Christianity and the women who identified as witches historically? And there's also a question about if if witches predate the Inquisition, because I think those two sort of have an interesting um, connection. Yeah, they do. Yes, they do predate the Inquisition. Um, the Inquisition comes to to them looking for heretics and it finds witches and it thinks, aha, this makes sense. These people are the same kind of people. So, yes, yes, they, they do predate that. And in some cases, yes, I think there is a history of pagan peoples, particularly pagan indigenous peoples, resisting Christian encroachment on their society so those people that I was writing about in uh, northern Norway for instance in one of my early chapters you know they, they they're called the Sami people and that they still exist today and they have their own culture they have their own religion they have their own spiritual world really but of course when they encountered people coming north from the you know the, the main heartland of Europe what they encountered was Christianity that wanted to convert them so there is this kind of frontier where there's a lot of friction between mm-hmm. pagan people and Christian people. And I do think that really feeds importantly into the history of witch trials, yes. That's really interesting too, because, you know, for people who like history, like I do, um, not as much as you, <laughs> Mary and Betty, I do. Um, <laughs> we know that around 2000 years ago, women were in power. They were, uh, you know, celebrated. And, you know, there was that pagan sort of like, uh, fertility woman was very much appreciated and, and, and celebrated and somehow that really turned around and you know obviously the inquisition is a big part of that i think that like um the christian belief system and the male taking over really had a huge part in that yes i think that <laughs> i think the modern religions um you know christianity and islam and judaism the ones that call themselves the religions of the book i do think they do change that world picture it's often quite difficult to say how empowered women were or exactly how ancient matriarchies worked or how ancient goddess worship worked but it does feel like there's a different climate then mm-hmm. yeah absolutely um different Simon. <laughs> uh, Marla says, and I think you might have answered this, but uh, what is the age range and the average age range of people accused of witchcraft? That's a really good question. It's hard um, to answer because there are an awful lot of records out there. And also there are a lot of big gaps in the bodies of records that we do have. So we're not entirely sure. It does look like the stereotype of the elderly female, which is actually quite a truthful one. Um, So lots of the people who were accused were women in probably their 50s to 80s, something like that. But there are also a surprising number of younger women that I'm becoming more and more interested in because every now and again I go and look at a witchcraft case and somebody some way you know some historian has well-meaningly written oh so-and-so was an old widow and you go and look at them there's a case of this in the book with one of the the cases in East Anglia and the the civil war Um, and I go and look at her and I discover she's a woman who's probably in her 40s because she's got a a three-year-old child Mm. and I can probably find a birth date for her so I, I think actually sometimes we are we, we should probably pay a bit more attention to how old they actually were rather than assuming that they were elderly. The fact that they were a widow doesn't always mean that they were old, of course. We've talked about all the diseases that were rife mm-hmm. in these early societies. So it was very easy for somebody to become a widow when they were in their 20s or 30s. Mm-hmm. So I think you need to look carefully at the, the, the specifics. But if you were to, to pick a, a number, you'd probably say older women were more likely to be accused. Um, there's a really interesting conversation going on in the chat. I don't normally pay attention because it goes by too quickly, but about er- ergo mold on the oh, yes. about hallucinations. Somebody says that it's been discounted. But interestingly, that obviously is a thing that people are interested in, but um, that would have only been one aspect if it was even true, right? Because witchcraft has been uh, going on for a long, long time in many eras. 
Yes, I think so. Yeah, it is a theory that's been put forward that what people, what people who said they were victims of witchcraft were experiencing was hallucinations and that they had got this um, from this kind of mould that grows on rye. And it was essentially a kind of LSD type compound. So ooh, no wonder they thought they were seeing unusual things. Um, it might have been part of a wider picture. I wouldn't discount it altogether, although historians tend to think that it doesn't really explain enough. I think it's probably more important that they lived in a very religious society which predisposed them to have certain kinds of fantasy or if they were sick and maybe had a fever to imagine certain kinds of visions. Um, but it might be part of a wider picture. And again, we really we really can't know um, what people were eating and drinking and the way their bodies are behaving is really, really hard to access. Mm -hmm. That's true, right? Because uh, as you said, the historical records really don't talk about the women that, as much in history as they do about uh, the conquerors. Yes. <laughs> it's sad. Um, it is, I, it is. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the fact there's so many historians and professors on this talk. Um, it's awesome. Um, this is a question that I just think is awesome and I have to ask it. Um, have you read uh, Deborah Harkness's uh, Discovery of Witches? Yes, serious. I have. <laughs> yes, I have. And I've watched a good part of the TV show as well, because I do love that sort of thing. You know, somebody's talking about witches and magic. Yes, I, I will very gladly read about it. And she's a professor too, of course, isn't she? <laughs> um, yes, she is actually. And I, I, uh, I, I find that, well, I won't give any spoilers away, but I do like that series as well. Um, all right. Last, I'm getting to the end here. Um, I, want, I do want to ask Eileen's question about how or why do you think witch hunts frenzies died down? I know they never went away, but how did they die down in those big times when they were happening? That's another great question, yeah. And all the things that we've said, you know, every time I look at this question, somebody usually asks it, and it's a really good question. We've seen how useful witchcraft was in society. You know, it helped you dispose of people in your community that you didn't like very much. And it helped you work out those kind of tensions that societies have about good and bad. Um, so why did we stop doing it? I don't know, <laughs> really. But some of the things I can suggest and that other historians have suggested are that the religious climate changed that people after the civil wars and the you know the horrible religious conflicts that consumed Europe and um, a good part of the wider world beyond it in the 16th 17th 18th centuries people started to think actually you know religion could be a little bit kinder so that people could actually stop killing other Christians because they thought they were the wrong type of Christians so I think that's probably a major factor that the religious climate changes and ministers and other kind of thought leaders, if you like, within the, the big religions start, start being more merciful, essentially. So I think that's an important part of it. If you're not hunting heretics, you're not finding witches in quite the same way that you would have been. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, there's there is the growth of modern medicine, although it is very slow. So people start to understand or at least look for different causes for types of disease or, you know, types of, of plant disease, you know, crop failure, stuff like that. Um, they start to understand meteorology, so they don't blame witches as much for storms. Things like that are quite important, I think. And then as you go forward, you know, there is also there are changing gender roles as well. So I think we've I think we've sort of sublimated all of that stuff into other parts of our society, maybe, if you like. Um, OK, I have two more questions. I lied. I have two more and still. <laughs> I'll ask a question I think is really, really interesting, too. Um, is there a relationship between the word witch? and the B word. Yes, I think there is really. Yes, it's, it's quite a popular thing for journalists to use the two interchangeably as a sort of pun, isn't it? Um, and that always slightly worries me because I think actually it is sort of the same impulse, isn't it? It's a slap word, isn't it? It's a way of slapping somebody, particularly a woman. And so I, I yes, I, I think it's a way of dismissing female authority, female thoughts, female speech, all of those kind of things sometimes. I love it. Um, I love the con the, the, that you have thought about this and, and can actually speak to the fact that it probably is a little bit of a switch so that, that women can constantly or consistently be put down um, in, with words, just words. Um, Ellen asked the last question. 
what are you working on now? What can we expect next from you? Oh, I'm yeah, I'm literally working on it today and enjoying it greatly. So <laughs> there's a big witchcraft trial in the 1640s during the English Civil War. I talk about it a little bit in one of the chapters of the book where I look at one of the women who was accused. and I look at the start of that witch hunt, but nobody's really written a big history of the whole hunt. And by the time it's finished, 200 to 300 people have been accused and it's spread across seven counties in eastern England. And, you know, it's it's a famous case. It gets made into the film, which find a general. Um, there are lots of novels about it. It just seems like it's a really big gap in, in sort of world history, but particularly English history. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the communities that send settlers to the United States. Um, I've literally got somebody, you know, you know in um, The Crucible, as Judge Danforth. I'm looking at, in these records of this village that I'm looking at in Eastern England, I'm looking at his father. I know it's him. He's Nicholas Danforth. I know he came from Framlingham in Suffolk. And he took his family to go and live in Framingham um, in Massachusetts. And they take the witchcraft idea with them. So it's this history of, of where all that starts, really. You know, there's this big witch trial in the 1640s, and it's so much like the Salem trial 50 years later. I really want to tell that story so that people see that Salem has an ancestor trial, if you like. So I'm writing about that one at the moment. And when can we expect that in our you know, <laughs> uh, And I've written it. Uh, I don't know. I've got a couple of chapters so far um i would have thought i'll probably take the next year to write it and then it will probably be the year after that so as soon as i can manage basically but imagine how many records there are i'm dealing with like 30 communities even just in in suffolk in, in suffolk in in eastern england so it's it's a big project but i think it's going to be really fun and i think at the end of it i will have a lot more stories to tell Wow. Well, you've had so many for us to share with you today. Thank you so much. And I can just imagine how fascinating that research is. It's so. such a pleasure to do. And it's such a pleasure to share it with you. Thank you for inviting me. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Absolutely. And when that next one comes out, or if you ever want to talk about witches, I am here for you. <laughs> oh, constantly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you to everybody who showed up and all of your wonderful questions. I hope you get to see some sort of Salem witch type of thing and understand it better after these kind of talks. So thank you, Mary. And it's been lovely. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for your questions and for all the thanks that I can see flooding <laughs> in. You know, thank you so much. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye then.